want to have a little bit of audience participation and make a little bit of history tonight because uh, Kurzweil, you know, Ray, Ray and I, we, we don't get on. I, I, find him, <laughs> I find him extremely optimistic, almost naively so, and, and almost uh, you know, not, not taking the, the, the possible negative side of the issue seriously enough. And it's, it's, it's almost childish. So what, what I'd like to do, the last few months I've been thinking, hey, wouldn't it be nice to start getting some polls, you know, opinion polls, getting, getting some solid sociological data. And then, uh, so I'd like, to, I'd like to do a little experiment tonight. You'd be the first audience of this kind of event in the world. So could I ask you to think hard for about 10, 20 seconds and let's keep things simple and, and actually vote on this issue. And then literally tonight, I will email Ray and say, <laughs> Ray, <laughs> X percent of the audience think what you say is dot, dot, dot. So, so here's, here's the question, and you know, give it some thought. Do you, and, and you know, don't treat it as a piece of science fiction, because this is an issue which, which will become very real in a matter of decades. And if I'm right, your children are going to be in a, involved in a war, the worst war that humanity's ever seen, because we're talking about the possible extinction of the human race, the loss of dominance of the human species. Okay? That's, that's what's the issue. So here's the question. Do you think humanity should build these artifacts, these, these godlike, massively superhuman intelligent machines, or do you think we should not? Right? I'll, I'll keep it simple. It's more subtle than that, but a, a simple yes or no answer. So think a moment. Are you, are you pro artifact? Do, do you think humanity should build them, or are you anti artifact? Do you think humanity should not build them? Well, let's let's take a vote, and then I'll. I'll email that back, back to Ray. And that'll be the first time in the world, as far as I know, that he's had real public, <laughs> public feedback. So let's make a little bit of history tonight, OK? So, so think, and then I'll ask you to raise your hands if you are pro artelect. Now, now can, we have, can we have somebody please counting hands? Uh, let's, it's hard. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eight, eight, twelve. Can, can we get lights on? Is that possible? No, no fair raising to her. <laughs> oh. Okay. Is that an, oh, oh, all right. Now, if you're anti, if you think it's too dangerous. Uh, what would you say? Is that about two thirds third? Is that, is that a fair? Would you say that's fair? A third, maybe? maybe? I think, yeah. I think it's more pro arsenal. A third, two thirds. Okay. Yeah, more like three quarters, one quarter. Yes. All right. Okay, something in that region. Okay, I'll, I will. I'll send that back to Ray tonight. Okay. The other thing. Um, do a lot of you um, watch? You go, hmm? that, this was an introduction. <laughs> so we'll just go through the introductions first, and then um, we'll get to whatever we're going to talk about. Can I so have one ben, minute, and then I'll shut up forever. <laughs> no. <laughs> shut up forever. That, that, that's undesirable. Um, I'm I'm Dr. Ben Gertzel. I'm based in. Washington, D.C., and Hong Kong. I work on artificial intelligence, trying to engineer beneficial uh, AIs with intelligence at a human level and beyond, as well as applications of AI to life extension and, and other useful things. See. Uh, I'm Steve Mahindro from Palo Alto, California, and uh, I also have a company building intelligent technologies uh, specifically aim to be beneficial for humanity and I've spent a lot of time in the last few years and we'll talk about some of it at the summit tomorrow and on Sunday um, ways to ensure that these systems uh, behave in alignment with human values and that are positive for humanity as opposed to creating uh, apocalyptic kind of outcomes. Okay, okay. Is any, uh, have anybody thought of any questions they'd like to pose to either one of the panelists? Okay, right at the back there. Okay, first of all, that question should have a third answer. I've heard choice, which was not yet, as opposed to just yes or no. Um, and it really wasn't asking what the ultimate question was, which is what does it mean to be human? Because when we really know what it means to be human, then we'll know what we really want from our robots. And we may not need them to be the gods that we can make. The thing I would also ask is, 
is intelligence the only way by which to judge the very particular species? And if so, it is the only way to judge. Do we have a responsibility to increase the intelligence of the other uh, species across the planet that may be um, able to support that increased intelligence? Well, I think one reason that intelligence is special is that once intelligence gets beyond a certain level, it becomes self-amplifying. So an intelligent system can create a more intelligent system, which can create a more intelligent system, and so forth. And it would appear to many of us that humans are beyond that threshold where intelligence is likely to amplify further and further in our, in our, various, uh, in our various creations. And Many other characteristics aren't, aren't like that, like someone who can run really fast. Once they get fast enough, they're not going to spawn someone who can run, spawn someone who can run even, even faster and so on. So the, the self-amplifying self characteristic of intelligence is, is important. In terms of what do we need to be human, what does it, rather, what does it mean to be human? I think that that's really a moving target, what it means to be human now bears little resemblance to what it meant to be human in, in the Paleolithic period, although there's some overlap, and part of what it means to be human is to redefine the meaning of humanity, which is what we're in the process of doing every day through inventing technologies and, and through other means. So I don't think there will be a moment when we pin down, yes, this is the meaning of humanity, which we need to preserve for all time. It, it's going to be changing and evolving along with us, our, our understanding of humanity. In terms of increasing the intelligence of non-human animals, I mean, I'm, I'm generally in favor of it. I, I would enhance the intelligence of my pet parrot, uh, dog, and rabbit, so that'd be really cool. So, <laughs> if, if they complain and say, no, make me stupid again, uh, I'd probably do that too. <laughs> so we'll just have to see how it goes, I think. I've got a comment about the animals. Um, People who study animal behavior have shown that if your niche is very simple, it's actually maybe not so good to be intelligent. It's better to be a simpler creature that sort of fulfills that niche very well, like the E. coli in our gut, um, don't have a very complicated task they need to do. And so giving them more intelligence maybe isn't, isn't the right thing. It's sort of like their nature, the very nature of the niche well, they Well, my dog would like to figure out how to have sex with a dog that's much larger than it. He's been doing that for a while, he, he, can, he can't do it. Dogs know? may be beyond <laughs> the threshold yeah. where... <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question? Oh, who do we have? Okay, I saw your hand up before. Um, what's your name up there with the, back, with the cat, black cat? Dave, I was wondering whether the uh, respected from Washington was happy with his makeup in the representation in the film. <laughs> uh, whether you're either of you pro evil robot professors are worried about people from the future being here to assassinate you. <laughs> 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 well, you'll be happy to know we're actually robot doubles. We're not. <laughs> Whereas I believe they will not be back. <laughs> and I'm actually pro limited systems, and so. Uh, so he's not as smart of a robot double as the rest. Exactly. Of right. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, over there. We may each have our own answers to that. I think we could each take that one. You can go first. Okay. Keep it under 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, ben, ben and I, we co guest uh, edited uh, the Planet's first special issue, that's like an academic journal devoted to one topic, on artificial brains. So we contacted the top artificial brain research project leaders around the world and asked them to write stuff. And that special issue came out, what, December, was it, last year? So we got a fairly good feel of you know, what's going on in the world in terms of artificial brain projects, because Moore's law you know, the, yeah, um, allows it. 
So my, my scenario, my time frame is the following. I see the dec this decade now, the 2010s, as the decade of uh, artificial brain projects just popping up like mushrooms all over the planet because there's so much involved. Uh, the Korean government, South Korean government is saying by about 2020, they're aiming to put a, a useful, intelligent home robot in every Korean household by 2020. And Bill Gates is on record as saying by about 2030, the home robot industry will be one of the biggest and richest in the world. I mean, ask yourself, how much would you pay for a genuinely useful home robot that would do all the household tasks? I mean, you'd pay probably more money than for a car. Okay? I'm glad someone's working on that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then in the 2020s, 2030s, uh, as you upgrade your home robot model, you will notice, and billions of people will notice, that the IQ gap between human level and their home robot level is closing every year. And then the, I call it the species dominance debate, will really start raging. It, it will become the dominant issue. And then political parties will be formed over the issue, and then the assassinations and the sabotage. And, and eventually, perhaps, it's, uh, what I'm so fearful of <coughs> is a major war. And if a major war comes with 21st century technologies, you're not talking the two or 300 million people who were killed last century over, over, you know, for political reasons but uh, billions, so I call this concept giga death. So I'm a real pessimist. I'm okay. glad I'm alive now. <laughs> so, so the question was timing. Yeah, well, Ben. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a, a large variance to the, the timing for human level AI and, and the singularity, and it, it largely depends on politics and funding allocated to different lines of research and engineering as, as much as it does on, on the fundamental technical issues. I think if, if humanity wanted to go all out for the singularity, we could have one in 10 years from now. And if, if we decide to focus on other things, it could take till 2100. I think that there's a strong tendency toward overconfidence when humans are making predictions. And that, that probably holds even for a brilliant man like Rick Kurzweil, who, who's great at predicting things. In terms of my own AI work, if I make the assumption that my design for an AI is basically correct, I come to the conclusion we could make a human level AI, say, between 2020 and 2025. And whether we'll achieve that depends on if our design is right, if we pull in enough funding and so forth. So I think Ray's, Ray's extrapolations are reasonable. It could come significantly sooner or significantly later. I, I do think He's certainly right it'll come this century. Like, I'll, I'll be pretty shocked if 2100 rolls around and, and there's been no human level AIs created. So <clears throat> all of Ray's predictions come from the exponential curve in Moore's Law. And the thing about exponentials is they work until they don't. All exponentials are actually S-curves. You know, they can't go on forever because you run out of matter in the universe, you know, at least. And so the big question is, well, when does Moore's Law end? People have been predicting the end of Moore's Law for probably the last 20 years, uh, and yet it's kept very, very steadily on. And looking forward, it looks like at least till 2019, uh, Moore's Law is pretty solid. Beyond that, I think, you know, when does nanotechnology come? Uh, Moore's Law, if it's going to keep going, probably ha it requires nanotechnology. I think that's much more uncertain. Like Ben said, uh, I think advances in AI could make it happen much quicker than that. And uh, if, if the technologies don't continue on with the same curve, it could happen much more slowly than that. I'm actually an advocate of a very slow takeoff so that as these technologies come, we can begin to integrate them and make choices you know, based on sort of deliberate consideration. Did you have a time? No, I don't make those predictions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, questions? Any questions? Oh, there's one over there. Sorry, what's your name? mentioned kind of obliquely in the movie was it's not really about setting laws like Asimov's laws that will make it all okay, but he referred to kind of if we can instill values in, in artificial intelligence that will kind of keep them on a compatible track with us. Considering that one of the main political debates that you referred to was what are our values and what are good values. Um, it, the movie didn't really touch on the question of equality. 
who gets this and who doesn't. And I imagine you've kind of wrestled with that before. Can you tell me where you got to? So I'll talk a lot about more about that tomorrow. Um, I think there are sort of three ways that we can manage these systems. The first is sort of what you were calling laws, ways of putting constraints on them so that they don't sort of run out of control in ways we don't like. The second is what you're calling values. We want them to want to behave in ways that we like. And then the third is to create a social environment with a social contract that they operate within very much the way we do with the legal system today with, with humans. And I think you're absolutely right that figuring out what our values are, in particular, which ones, how much do we weigh equality versus individual freedom, you know, all the classic um, conundrums that philosophers have been grappling with are going to come, you know, we have to decide when we build these machines, what are their values going to be, how do we do that? And so my own solution is to start with very limited systems, and one of the first tasks for them is to help us codify uh, human values that incorporate, you know, all people on the planet. and you know, all really look at the ramifications, the long-term ramifications of different uh, value choices. But this is where a point. Excuse me. We've got these deadlines. Can we do it in time? We haven't. That's part of the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. This is the point I was going to raise. As Steve said in one of his previous uh, answers, how rapid the so-called takeoff is that has large implications for how judiciously we can even attempt to, to manage it. I mean, in, in the, the most extreme hypothesis, which, which I think is probably not plausible, some mad scientist AI, he's coding in his basement, like, today it's kind of the level of a dog. All of a sudden, it's, its brain code self-organizes. The next day, it shoots up, and it's a hundred times more intelligent than the human race, and says, ha ha, humans, you must serve me. And, and the, on the, the, the other extreme would be, it gets slightly more intelligent year after year after year, say one IQ point each year. And in that case, we have a lot of time to think about how ethical are these things? What does it mean for them to be ethical? Can they kind of participate together with us in the, in the continual redefinition of what it means to be human and what, what it means to be ethical? The reality will probably be somewhere between those two extremes I named. And honestly, we don't know how fast the takeoff is going to be. We have some control over that collectively, and we don't yet know how much control we have over that either. So that, that's a key point. It's both technological and political. What, what worries me the most is in the early days, uh, all three of us are more or less brain builders or AI makers or whatever you want to call us, is in the early days, um, we, we can try to make these machines AI friendly. That means they're friendly to human beings. But what worries me, like for example, if I take a little grain of sugar and imagine that it's nanotech, and each at you're putting one bit of information on one atom, and that atom's flipping back and forth, zero, one, zero, one in femtoseconds, there's more computing capacity in that grain of sugar than our human brain uh, calculated it was a quintillion. That's like a, a million trillion times. Uh, it's sort of hard to get your mind around you know, those huge numbers. But these, these creatures that potentially we could build this century will be godlike. Right? It has all kinds of religious connotations. So who is to say that these creatures, in a, in, I call them artilects, once they're in, in a hyper-intelligent form, who knows what their ethics and what... I mean, I'll make this analogy. Like every, every time I do that, I'm killing bacteria. Right? I only give a damn. Because I'm so superior to bacteria. So who's to say you know, these godlike creatures may eventually become so superior to us, they look on humans as just nothing. Maybe, maybe they may decide, oh, let's get rid of all the oxygen, because it's better for their circuitry or something, and not give a damn about the consequences to us. So I, I see this issue as absolutely dominate, dominating our global politics. If you come to the, to the um, summit, the Singularity Summit uh, tomorrow, then you will be uh, just wave it in front of you. You'll be given a formal questionnaire to express more in, in greater detail what, what your views are, and then we'll send your results to, to the media. And uh, while I'm on it, in November this, this year, have a look at Discovery Channel. There'll be a new documentary out on, specifically on the singularity. And I don't know if you've heard, but you've all, you've all heard the name um, Steven Spielberg. Have a guess what he's directing. There's a, a new science fiction novel 
come out just recently, a month or two back, called Robopocalypse. Ro Ro you can imagine what it's about. <laughs> and he will be directing that movie, and it will be out in uh, two years, so 2013. And that movie will probably... See, one of the problems we have is trying to get the message out. Right? I've been... I've been well, Nor do we fully agree on the message. I, I, I think I, I mean, I, 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 I agree with Hugo that most likely, eventually, humanity or our descendants will create intelligences probably as far beyond us as, as we are bacteria, as we are beyond bacteria. And these intelligences, if they're that much smarter than us, will probably be largely indifferent. To us, and I do kill a lot of bacteria when I take penicillin. <laughs> On the other hand, I'm not devoting my life to going out and stomping out all the bacteria in, in the world. So I'm, these possibilities are out there, and they're sufficiently far off that I don't know how to think about them in detail. So I tend to think more about the next steps that I can understand better, like how do you build AIs that are slightly more intelligent than humans and cause them to do good rather than harm, whereas the further future things are, are so far out, I feel like the, the AIs I create, they're slightly more intelligent than me, will have a better chance of thinking about the super, super god minds than, than I do. And in, in terms of the nearer term of super intelligent AIs that are only a bit smarter than us, rather than godlike, as, as Hugo alludes to, I'm... I'm not so confident as Hugo is that there will be a world war. I, I very much doubt there, there will be, actually. I, I think that there will be a mixture of different attitudes about this, but I don't see a huge armed conflict. I mean, I've, I've, I've talked to many people who are not high-tech at all and don't, don't have electricity or, or televisions and so forth. I was recently in Mongolia. I, I tried to discuss the singularity with these guys <laughs> living, in, living in yurts out in the steppes. And I mean, what, I, I, don't, I don't see these people waging war against us who are trying to build AIs and, and freeze, our, freeze our brains in preparation for the singularity and so forth. I mean, I think they, they may think we're strange, but uh, a, a world war is, is unlikely. So I, I don't agree with my good friend Hugo on this. And I guess he, he probably hopes I'm right, because a world war is not, not anything any of us want to see. But, but, I mean, you made a point in the movie uh, dramatically or melodramatically, you know, we're saying it all comes down to if, if you're uh, in favor of building these godlike creatures, then that means, if you think about it, that means that you accept the risk that humanity may be wiped out. But we seem to accept risk implicitly all the time by building all sorts of dangerous things yeah, in, the, in the world, and the world doesn't vote on it, it just yeah, but this, kind of happens because okay. some party does it. This, I think it's just going to keep going like that. But this time it's about the survival of us. Right. Okay. So is synthetic biology, and it's happening right now, and no one's trying to shut down the MIT synthetic biology lab. Well, I do think a lot of people will just not tolerate the idea that humans become number two. And I, I think they'll go to war to defend it. And you know, we need the sociological data to, to verify that. See, you people, you're selected, right? You're filtered. You're here because you're interested in this stuff. But out there, what do they feel? <coughs> My experience is it's about 50-50. And that's scary. That is very <laughs> scary. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. go. And you're next. Uh, my name is Natasha. Um, as far as I know, today science still doesn't know exactly what consciousness is, how mm. thoughts arise. So how can you, if you, if you don't know much about this world, about consciousness itself, how can you talk about creating something which exceeds consciousness? Well, Picasso didn't know what beauty was, and he painted a beautiful picture. It's, a, it's, not, it's not an analogy. Well, it, it is, because I, I think in, in 20 years or 30 years, we're going to have intelligent robots sitting in a place like this, and we can debate the nature of consciousness with them, and then they may not be able to, to pin it down to your satisfaction either, but they'll still be there talking to you, and you can argue with them about whether they're, they're conscious or not. But uh, the whole always bigger than parts. So today, the <coughs> technology can, which can uh, exceed some particular functions which uh, brain does, like better counting, better something, 
but it still doesn't it doesn't mean you can create something because the hole is much bigger than something different than all this well emergence the... to me emergence and consciousness are not the same issue i mean I, personally regarding consciousness my views are sort of buddhistic i'm a panpsychist i think every every particle everything is, is conscious and different systems manifest consciousness in, in different ways but I, I don't think that's critical to my ai work in terms of emergence there's already many many examples of engineered systems where the whole does more than than the parts for example i mean if you remove a part from your car it may not go anywhere but the whole the car no cycle the whole car engine operates in a in a holistic way and then there's on the more emergent level, in, there's neural net systems and artificial life systems which demonstrate emergence achieved in, in software. So I think the fact that the whole is more than the sum of the parts makes building AIs difficult, but I don't think it makes it impossible. It just makes it an interesting science problem. I think it's also, I, I agree, and I think it's worth differentiating consciousness from intelligence. So I view intelligence as just the ability to solve problems. Whereas consciousness, we really don't know what it is. We have a, a personal experience of it. There are many different theories. And I think building these systems, I, I think it's pretty clear we can build intelligent systems, systems which can solve problems. Whether they're conscious or not, I think is going to be a very interesting outcome. And there are people that believe consciousness is intimately tied to quantum mechanics, for example. And so I, I think one of the great um, outcomes of this research in terms of humans understanding ourselves will be to help shed light on things like quality and consciousness and, and those, you know, eternal questions. Conscious? Um, if you ask me what consciousness is, uh, my answer would be, I, don't, I feel I don't even have the conceptual tools to even to begin to think about what it is. But I do know this, whatever it is, it's built. Right? We, we know embryologically, when babies grow, we know that nature and evolution has found a way to assemble molecules in such a way that, that creates, it builds a three-dimensional creature that's intelligent and conscious. So we know there's a solution out there. In a sense, in every cell in our body is a solution, how to build a conscious creature in, in our DNA. The solution's out there, we just have to find it sooner or later. So probably it's only a matter of decades, I believe, before we have conscious machines. Yeah, um, you were talking about risks before and about how um, uh, you believe people shouldn't take this risk to, to get there. Is that correct? The, to, to get to uh, the singularity because of the, or, or the, the damage that it can cause. I'm not stuff. sure Hugo was saying we shouldn't. I think he's saying that we he's will. He's frightened that we will. And some yeah. people will be opposed right. to it. Indeed, some people will be opposed to it. People are opposed to smoking, and lot other people smoke. People are opposed to drinking, hurting each other, and all that sort of thing, and other people do it. We're a, a crazy, crazy bunch of people. Um, so, Speak for yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, my question is, given the disparity in, in our consciousness alone, how could we not expect a disparity within uh, an, an intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence as well? It's created by crazy people like us, so how would it not have our flaws? Well, when I'm thinking about how to engineer my AI's motivational and goal and emotional system. I'm not thinking about how to most closely model the human mind in, in those aspects. So this is a point where I diverge a bit from Ray Kurzweil in the sense that his main focus in terms of AI science is on emulating the human brain architecture at, at some rough level of approximation. And I'm not so sure that's a good idea because there, there's always the old saying that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But this is a statement induced from human history and human experience. It's about human psychology. I don't think it's an intrinsic law of, of intelligence. I think one can engineer AI systems that are more rational, more goal-oriented and less crazy and erratic than, than human beings are. You can build an AI system to begin with specific goals and to choose actions that it calculates will help achieve its goals. And this is no absolute guarantee of, of anything because we're totally going into unknown territory, building stuff smarter than ourselves. But I would bet if you do that, the problems you run into will not be the same ones that, that we run into with our emotion and motivation systems that 
basically were designed to, to run around in the African savanna and, and try to get food and sex and protect ourselves. Okay, I, look, I, I wish we had more time for um, questions. There can be more questions after this screening. We're going to the bar later. We've got time for one more question and Avatar's been asking for ages. So, Avatar Polymorph. Which bar? Oh, it's just a bar here. It's a Nova bar. You can we'll direct you. We'll go to in there later. <laughs> Which, out of Bush robots and Claytronics, which do you think will be more relevant to singularity? Which robots? Bush robots. Bush? Mar Mar Marriage? Bush robots? Oh, which, with the fractal yeah, arms. Yeah. That, yeah. Or Claytronics. Which, which will be more relevant to, to the development of singularity? Claytronics, it's that Carnegie Mellon. It, it, it's, it's sort of like uh, to want the robot out of small pieces, each of which is a sensor and, and an actuator. Oh, you, right, right, right. Clay. But, I mean, it's, I, I don't know which of those exact technologies is, is, is going to be best. I think conceptually, I like the direction of Claytronics. I, I like the idea of making every part of the robot's body both a sensor and an actuator, so that the whole system is intelligent in each piece, rather than in current robots, say that the now robot or the PR2, most of the body is neither a sensor nor an actuator, it's just, just there to hold up the small set of sensors and actuators. So I think that that direction is, is conceptually correct. I don't think it's needed to make human level AI. I think we could do that with current robotics technology or even without giving it a robot body, just where its embodiment is, is the internet, essentially. But I think better and better robot bodies like these technologies are, are moving towards will, will be a good thing. I think just the diversity of those two suggests that once AIs get on the problem of developing what's the best bodily form to take, it may look totally different than anything like we can you. imagine. Probably a sphere. Okay, oh, I don't, that's about um, all the time we have for an theater. However, um, we can continue this discussion at the bar, the Nova Bar, and also at the Singularity Summit. So um, come and talk to us later. Thanks for coming, guys. I really appreciate it. James over there is holding. He's organising that trip. He's official organiser, but I organise it too sometimes and he's not around and it always goes. Okay. Um, I organise the Singularity Salon and the Summits. James is also helping with that. So we kind of like, James is the guy over there with the EF squad. Yeah, no worries. Nice question, by the way. Thank you. Let's get the first time to know my team. So it's my next to work. So I'm just trying to learn about the first Well, it starts at 8.30. Oh, really? I had no idea. And it's actually until 9. 8 o'clock at night. I really like it. And it's Sunday. So 24 hours of singularity action. Every part is with a sensor. Well, that's cool. It's coming to be friendly. Thank you, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I remember the guy at the AGI. No, spears won't work. I know that you will because actually I can. I have these special mind reading properties given to me by AI oh, yeah. that said that Adam will will know. <laughs> Adam will know that someone will pull out and there will be a slot available. I really think I should put something in. Right? Yeah. I think economics is very important. Why can you feel like a, a John Horgan? No, I'm not actually. Well, I yeah, I am a gadfly. I'll be a bit of a gadfly. Or well, what's the? But no, it's not actually. You know, the really. I had, just hit me actually at the last. The last part of it. The film. The, no, the last part of the discussion. Yeah, interesting. I, no, I don't agree that it's going to be wars about it. Right? Yeah. 
<laughs> Thanks, Tim. To go. You've done really well. I do realise that. Sorry? Yeah, it's just the one thing to do. Species dominance. Yeah, this is one particular area of the species. Oh, it's quite um, Hugo's got a lot to say about that. He's they got more money, but they lost their staff, and they're probably the So actually, out of the Aboriginals that I speak to, they say that the ones that had the choice of living in the bush and living in the city, I've lived with them, okay? I grew up, yeah, I do, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not I used to live at that. My mum picked me up when I was 13 and went to live there. And I lived in a halfway house. I was living in the Aboriginal house. And I was a child. No, I was a lot of us. Not an Aboriginal house. But you can't believe it. Yeah, well, yeah, you should see my old friends. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, it's true. Um, I, they were happy about the, the idea that they could be late. Five hours. They've got to drink there. No? Well, yes. <laughs> they're, they're happy that they could get medical bad, attention though. later. I run out, are you living in, <laughs> living in a green hell? Yeah. Like I always have to stop. Anyway, they're only they're like, like a cent each. Almost. Almost. <laughs> Everybody's idea of fun. No, no, no I'll, I'll run out like two or three a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y